Today is our first of four episodes celebrating Black History Month 2023. Though Black history is an important part of American history every month of the year, February is the time that we reflect on the many contributions that have been made by people of the African diaspora the world over. I have long been interested in classical music. My family had season tickets to the Cincinnati Symphony concerts and Cincinnati opera performances. I studied classical piano and violin as a child. Having an interest in this style of music at that time was considered somewhat unusual for blacks. But it was hard for me to believe that blacks had never been involved in classical music in prior eras. I loved it, and surely others must have as well. But there was no information readily available on this topic. None of the photos of classical musicians featured blacks. There was no info available at all. I received a bachelor and master of music degrees, yet the curriculum never included any black classical musicians pre-20th century. Sure, there was Marian Anderson, William Grant Still, Andre Watts, and a few other 20th century classical musicians who were occasionally mentioned, but they were considered a phenomenon. Ten years ago, I decided to embark upon my own research on the topic. The information was not easy to locate, but I found some good info that I began sharing with my students. It's important that an accurate representation of history be readily available to everyone. It's unfortunate that groups of people have been omitted, and it's time to do our due diligence to make all history accessible. I want to talk about a few of the pre-20th century classical composers and musicians of the African diaspora that have been part of my research. These composers and musicians were from different parts of the world, but were all of the African diaspora. Cheers to the contributions that all cultures have made to the world as we know it today. People of African descent have been overlooked in many areas, including the area of classical music. It is often said that Blacks have only recently become involved in composing and playing classical music. This simply is not true. There have been many Black composers and musicians of classical music throughout the centuries. Some have been French, some Spanish, some Italian, some American, but they are all of the African diaspora. Some of these musicians were of mixed race, some had been slaves, and some were free black men. It's time that our educational curriculum recognizes and celebrates the existence and accomplishments of classical composers and musicians of the African diaspora. It's time that their story is told. This presentation features a few of the outstanding pre-20th century classical musicians of the African diaspora. English royal records document the employment of John Blank, listed as the Black Trumpeter. He was paid by the day by both Kings Henry VII and Henry VIII. A pictorially illuminated manuscript of the Tournament of Westminster on New Year's Day in 1511 tells the story. The tournament was commissioned by Henry VIII to celebrate the birth of his son, who died as an infant, to his wife Catherine of Aragon. This pictorial manuscript clearly portrays Blank as a highly respected and well-paid mounted black trumpeter. In the 16th century, he was earning the equivalent of $60 per day in today's dollars. 
This was a great deal of money at that time. He was wealthy. This is the story of John Blanc, otherwise known as the Black Trumpeter. Not much is known about John Blanc due to the poorly documented material of him living and the fact that he lived so long ago. However, what we do know and what was listed even by Henry VIII was that he was a highly respected musician. So much so that he even played at the funeral of King Henry VII. Not only was John respected by the royal family, but he was also a free man. For his services, John was paid eight pence a day by King Henry VII, which is the equivalent of around £22 in today's money. Years later, John created a petition requesting a pay rise from King Henry VIII, doubling his pay to 16 pence a day, so around £44 in today's money. Blanc is also depicted twice in the Westminster tournament role, which shows the celebration of the birth of King Henry VIII's son to Catherine of Aragon. Blanc appears once performing at the entrance of the king and the other playing as the king leaves. To gain an understanding of the importance of such an event, it would be like the equivalent of playing at the Olympics today. What is most incredible about the records of John Blanc is that it documents the existence of free Africans as far back as 500 years in the UK. This challenges the belief that the history of Britain's relations with Africa started with the slave trade and rejects the belief that the history of black people coming to the UK began with the Windrush generation. Want to learn more and access our free resources? Follow www.theblackcurriculum.com for more info. The next composer on our list is Ignatius Sancho. He lived from 1729 until 1780. He was an African composer and author whose published letters tell much about his life. Raised as a house slave in Greenwich, England, he taught himself to read and educated himself very broadly from books owned by an aristocratic family with whom he obtained employment as a young man. Sixty-two of his short compositions survive in four self-published volumes. Let's listen to Sancho's Minuet. Next, we have José Mauricio Núñez García. He was born in 1767 and died in 1830. He was an Afro-Brazilian, and he was a Roman Catholic priest. He was an organist and chapel master in the Cathedral of Rio de Janeiro. Most of his music was liturgical or religious. About 240 works survive. In 1817, Garcia wrote Brazil's first opera, Les Due Gemel, The Two Twins, which was later destroyed by fire. Here is a piece performed by Camarate Vocal Sin Nomine of Havana, Cuba. Thank you. 
George Bridge Tower. He was born in 1780 and died in 1860. He was a child prodigy with an African father and a German mother. As a child, he joined the retinue of the Prince of Wales, later George IV, who arranged music studies with established musicians. In 1802, Bridgetower obtained permission to travel to the continent to visit his mother. In the spring of 1803, he met Beethoven, who quickly wrote his Sonata for Violin and Piano, Opus 47, for Bridgetower. Beethoven played the piano, and Bridgetower played the violin at the highly successful premiere of the Sonata in Vienna on May 24, 1803. Before the work was published, the two men had a disagreement, causing Beethoven to replace Bridge Tower's name on the manuscript with that of Rudolf Kreutzer. Here's a piece by Bridge Tower. I'm not sure too many musicians can say that Beethoven composed a piece for them, but George Augustus Paul Breen Bridge Tower can say just that. He was born in Poland to a German mother and West Indian father. Both his parents served European aristocrats, which meant that George grew up in a castle complete with a puppet theatre and opera house. Like Mozart, he was a child prodigy and toured with his violin to places such as Bath, Bristol and London. One French journal said, His talent is one of the best replies one can give to philosophers who wish to deprive people of his nation and his colour of the opportunity to distinguish themselves in the arts. George came to Trinity Hall in 1811 at the age of 30 to complete a bachelor's degree in music. To earn this, he had to do an exercise which involved writing a musical composition to poetry and performing it with a full orchestra at Great St. Mary's Church. Fluent in English, German, French, Italian and Polish, he mixed with royalty and musicians across Europe. He was a great friend of Beethoven who called him a virtuoso and composed for him a sonata for pianoforte and violin in A. George even made some alterations to the violin part, which Beethoven responded to by saying, Noch einmal, mein lieber Bursch. Unfortunately, George and Beethoven fell out after George insulted a female friend of Beethoven's. Beethoven was so incensed that he actually scratched out the dedication to George and gave it to another violinist called Kreutzer, who didn't even attempt to play the piece saying that it was too hard. Since his death at the age of 81 in Peckham in South London, there have been many more dedications to George that haven't been scratched out. Dedications that appear in films, plays and even in a jazz opera. As I reflect on the life of George Bridgetower, I am so amazed at how excellent this man was. I think it's interesting that throughout history, many, many black people have been omitted, scratched out or censored. But today we are curating and we are remembering someone who was an excellent violinist, an excellent person in the field of classical music. And it's just a representation of how black excellence continues to thrive today. Now we're going to talk about an organization that included several black musicians, and composers of the time. The Negro Philharmonic Society was founded in New Orleans well before the Civil War. The orchestra at one point had more than 100 performers, including a few white members. Its director, Constantine de Berg, was a black violinist. Racial hostility put an end to the society prior to the Civil War. Two of its former members, Edmund Dede, he lived from 1827 to 1903, and Charles Lucien Lambert, who lived from 1828 to 1896, fled New Orleans in the 1850s and made successful careers in France and Brazil. Dede graduated from the Paris Conservatory and worked as a conductor in Bordeaux, France for 27 years. In the early 20th century, there were other orchestras, including the Clef Club Orchestra of Harlem, New York, which boasted a membership of 125 musicians of African descent. Here is Mephisto Musk for piano, written by Edmund Dede.
Justin Holland. He lived from 1819 to 1887. He was a classical guitarist who composed and arranged hundreds of works which were widely played in the 19th century. After two periods at the Oberlin Conservatory in Ohio, he became Cleveland's first black professional classical musician and music teacher. He was a civil rights activist and worked in the same national circles as abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Let's hear some of his music. is José Silvestre White. He lived from 1835 to 1918. He was an Afro-Cuban violinist who excelled as a student at the Paris Conservatory and later served as a professor there for many years. During the 1875-1876 season, White performed twice with the New York Philharmonic under conductor Theodore Thomas. We have a photo that was taken after he received first prize at the Conservatoire de Paris in 1856. Check out our show notes for the photo. Here is his concerto for violin. Samuel Coleridge Taylor. He lived from 1875 to 1912. He was an Afro-British composer who wrote Hiawatha's Wedding Feast in 1898. He called himself an Anglo-African and fought against race prejudice all his short life. He incorporated Black traditional music with concert music, in such compositions as African Suite, African Romances, and 24 Negro Melodies. The first performance of Hiawatha's Wedding Feast was described by the principal of the Royal College of Music as one of the most remarkable events in modern English music history. And this work was acclaimed on both sides of the Atlantic. Here is his African suite.
The last composer that we'll talk about today is William Grant Still. He lived from 1895 until 1978. He was an oboist, arranger, and composer. He composed more than 150 works, including five symphonies and eight operas. Still is often referred to as the Dean of African American composers. Still was the first American composer to have an opera produced by the New York City Opera. Still is known most for his first symphony, which was, until the 1950s, the most widely performed symphony composed by an American. Here is the brilliant young black violinist Randall Goosby playing William Grant Still's Suite for Violin and Piano. information on these wonderful Black composers and musicians, check out our show notes. In this brief presentation, we hope that we have contributed to your knowledge and understanding of Black history. Wishing you a happy Black History Month.